Hi, how are you? Very good, thanks. Good? Your mic is on? China. Hopefully. Yeah, yeah, here's my mic. Where are you from, Monty? So I'm originally from Bavaria, you know, but I'm uh, now in the heart of Crypto Valley, extending to a little country called Liechtenstein, uh, which we now call Crypto Nation. And I can tell why that is. You want to share that, maybe? We have some time to wait for everybody else to come on stage. Absolutely. Um, so, you know, Liechtenstein is introducing a set of laws called the Blockchain Act, mm -hmm. which is basically enabling the whole industry to thrive in terms of uh, regulating, but not too heavily. So they're setting up a kind of a light laws uh, for ICOs, for um, tokenizing of financial assets. And that's the reason also why we incorporated the company over there. Great. Thank you for being here. Yeah. So we have somebody else. Here's your mic on. Uh, not all. It's okay. Would you like to introduce yourself? Yeah, hi. I'm, I'm I know you from yesterday, but some people here don't know you. So. Yes, uh, th th thank you for introducing me to the panel. I'm Konstantin. I'm CEO of uh, Changely Instant Exchange Service. Uh, we are operating about three years on the market. We have about two million customers on Changely worldwide in the United States, uh, from Korea, from Japan, and also from Europe. So we are quite big, and uh, we have tons of integrations with Jack's wallet, with Bread wallet, with Coinemy. We are partners of uh, Coin Market Cap, one of the biggest. So uh, I think a few years on the crypto, it's like 10 years in any other industry. <laughs> yeah. Great. So maybe you want to share some first insights of you know, the topic? You want to get people juiced up? Do you have any first comments, maybe? The ecosystem? What does the ecosystem look like now? Uh, so I agree with Jimmy Wales. Uh, he talked uh, a few hours before, like uh, crypto in a bubble now. Uh, yes, it's quite a bubble, uh, but if you're looking back to uh, dot com boom, uh, the bubble was much bigger actually. So, and uh, we are preparing for the next wave actually. And uh, I understand that market now is quite flat, uh, but uh, it will rise again and it will be a wave much, much bigger than now. Yep. Okay. So, let's hope we can ride the wave. So, I think I just heard some information that we have the speakers are ready here. So, Addy, are you ready? <laughs> Addy, Addy, Addy. Here you go. Well done. Everybody just a round of applause, please, for Addy. Thank you. Take your seat. Welcome. Um, thank you, Muni, for moderating the panel. Uh, now I'm on stage, so... Let's do that, guys. And sorry, everyone, for just a little confusion, but now we are all here. And uh, I think that, I hope that our panel will be valuable for all of you guys. So, exchanges. Um, all of our panelists today are knowledgeable. They are experienced in this field. So that's why they're here with us. Um, before we start, Guys, can you briefly introduce yourself and uh, why are you here, actually? Why are you sitting with us? And uh, why is it valuable for the audience to hear what you're saying? Monty, maybe we can start with you. Yeah. So my name is Monty Metzger. <clears throat> I'm uh, in the digital space since uh, mid-90s. I've been founding a couple of companies. And in the uh, last couple of years, I've been running a venture fund investing in blockchain companies globally. And now I teamed up with um, an Asian friend of mine, which I know since over 10 years, and he had been starting two exchanges in Taiwan. And we are now taking this technology out of an unregulated space into something which is regulated, fully compliant, and we are doing that in Liechtenstein. So what I'm founding now is uh, something called LCX, so Liechtenstein Crypto Assets Exchange. And we are doing that in teamwork with the bank, uh, so we have a bank as a shareholder, we have a proven technology platform, and last but not least, we're doing that in a fully uh, regulated environment in Liechtenstein. Thank you. Konstantin? Yeah, as I briefly introduced me again, I'm Konstantin, CEO at Changely Instant Exchange. Uh, we are worldwide business. Uh, we have tons of customers, about 2 million customers from US, Asia market, and also many customers from Europe. 
We have a lot of integrations with wallets, uh, JAX, uh, uh, CoEnemy. We are biggest partner of Coin Market Cap and uh, Binance. Uh, we also Binance partners. So, yeah, just what we are doing. Thanks, um, Ajit. Hi, uh, my background is in capital markets, consulting, regulation, and technology. Uh, spent several years at Goldman Sachs, Barclays, Credit Suisse, and UBS. Uh, started the blockchain UK business for PwC, built it for three years. Uh, then uh, over the last uh, eight months now, I've been working at Consensus. Consensus is a, a ventures production studio uh, based in Brooklyn. We have an office in London. Not the conference. Uh, <laughs> thank you. No. So, uh, yeah, we have offices. Now we are starting you know, various teams all over Europe, and we have a an office in London. Uh, I'm a partner with the London uh, business, and uh, I focus on our global decentralized exchange portfolio. Uh, that's quite an exciting area of uh, both experimentation and ecosystem development, and I spend a lot of time working on policy, regulation, technology, and ecosystem growth. Thank you. Bobby? Hi. I'm Bobby Lee. I'm a board member of the Bitcoin Foundation, and I'm also the co-founder uh, of BTCC. We're known first as BTC China. So I used to run BTC China. It was China's very first Bitcoin exchange that was started in 2011. And due to circumstances, it actually had to shut down late last year in uh, September of 2017. So we ran for a good six, over six years. So at one point, I ran the, one of the world's largest exchanges and also the world's longest running exchange because MT Gox closed down. So we had that dubious honor, but in any case, uh, so I don't run the exchange anymore. So I'm a, I'm a free man. I'll speak my anything I want. I have a question regarding BTCC a little bit further, but anyway, thank you for clarifying. Um, so I would love to start our panel with um, one interesting quote, and then uh, based on this quote, ask the questions to you guys. So there is a very interesting thing. Um, one man said, money united people, much better than any religion did. So cryptocurrencies nowadays to turn out not just to be another way of money, but for, especially for early adopters, turn out to be a whole religion nowadays. So, um, and cryptocurrencies, ex cryptocurrency exchanges in this way play a very big role. You, mm, they know the trends, they can influence the market. So the first, question will be pretty broad. Um, you know, cryptocurrency exchanges are playing one of the major roles in uh, bringing cryptocurrencies to wider circulation and finally can bring them to mass adoption. Do you agree with this statement and uh, just what do you think about this? So, Eddie, absolutely. I think at the moment their institutional investors are lined up to invest into that space. But currently, there are not many places where they can do it in a fully compliant way. Um, and so that's why I think it's really an opportunity that exchanges enable to grow the market space overall. So I am true a believer that we are still at the early ages and the, and the beginning. If you look at financial assets to be tokenized, we're talking about several trillion dollars entering the market in the next couple of years. And that's the big opportunity to really take it out of the kind of the niche um, to become a, a global opportunity. You said about institutional investors, right? Uh, that's a, another very big topic. But right now, um, I don't think that there are some, there are no institutional investors coming into the space. And uh, I think, personally, I think that the uh, quality of trading now, the liquidity is pretty low. Right? So what do you think about it? Do you agree with this statement? <laughs> Absolutely. So imagine if large funds would start trading, the ma the, most of the exchange would collapse, more or less. Um, so the, the overall infrastructure needs to be built and needs to be brought to a, to a different level. And um, so institutional money is basically watching the space, and there's, it's already starting. You know, there are a few um, areas where they're already active, and of course, security token exchanges will play a dominant role for that. So that's why we developed something called the Liechtenstein Protocol, where we are um, setting up a, a legal infrastructure where we could do security token trading as well. 
how is it different from what we have now in terms of regulation? You say you, uh, in Liechtenstein you're going to wholly regulate it, right? So it will be a wholly uh, wide area. Yeah. How does it look? Well, if you look to the US, there's the big discussion about utility and security token. I don't um, think that's really relevant. Um, we could say we, we're building something which is more hybrid. Um, because the ultimate goal is actually to make sure that investors are kind of secured. So what we do is we issue kind of investor passports. So when they um, comply with AML and KYC regulation, uh, we then um, check on both sides and just make sure that each trade is happening between these uh, kind of fully identified investors. And what does it mean for current traders? those who, who are trading now, for example? Well, on, on LTX, it will be kind of a separate um, uh, kind of, uh, I would say, channel. So one would be um, the crypto assets as we know it, and the other one will be fully focusing on security tokens. Okay, security tokens is also a very, very uh, big uh, topic. So let's go into, into security tokens if you talk. If, for example, the regulators uh, consider all of the current tokens as security, as securities. What will happen with the industry? What will happen to the crypto exchanges? What do you think, guys? Uh, if I can take that. Uh, so it, I mean, I don't think regulators will consider all tokens as securities because ultimately, you know, tokens are a way of implementing uh, or digitizing assets or implementing digital assets that have economic characteristics of either commodities, securities, currency. So it, it all depends on, on the actual, I mean, tokens are program, programmable money, right? And depending on the economic characteristics and of the, the implementation or the, the economic behavior of the token, the regulators will effectively govern uh, those under some of the existing rules. But then in certain cases, the existing rules may have to be adopted uh, for this new technology as well. Right, so for example, so, I mean, it's very hard to argue that uh, Bitcoin or Ethereum are securities, right? They are uh, widely spread decentralized mined commodities and the CFTC governs Bitcoin already as a, as a commodity. So, uh, but to the extent that certain tokens are security and then a large number of tokens will fall under the definition, then uh, the, 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 we will have to understand as to how the various rules and regulations that govern the behavior of uh, securities exchanges uh, will apply and will probably need to be adapted to this uh, new ecosystem. Good. Uh, Bobby, and, uh, what's going on in China in, in, in that terms? Before, before we talk about China, I want to comment on the earlier topics. So you were asking about cryptocurrencies as investments, whether people are putting in money. I, I want to make a distinction, and I think most of the audience knows this, but it's, it's meaningful to really think about this more carefully. For the first time since the invention of Bitcoin, we have true digital assets. And I'm talking about the decentralized digital currencies of which Bitcoin is, is amongst the leader. Yep. Uh, however, if you look at CoinMarketCap, if you look at all those sites, literally there are hundreds of other tokens or coins being exchanged. But those are not all cryptocurrencies. Many of them are crypto tokens. And tokens are just a representation of something else. They are, in fact, centralized. It just happens to be a digitized asset versus a purely originally digital asset. So that's why I want to emphasize a lot of people, especially new investors, come in. They, they think it's all the same. They think that buying an ICO token is the same as buying Bitcoin, Ethereum, Litecoin. And I urge them to, to uh, really study that more carefully. It's, it's quite different. It's like confusing the role of money, you know, euros and British pound, versus what you can buy with the money, let's say, on the German, French, or the, the, the London Stock Exchange. So the stocks that you can buy on those stock exchanges are different than the currency that you use to buy the stocks. And furthermore, um, like you said, some tokens are not even security tokens. They're just utility tokens. To me, that's like movie tickets or golf course uh, teeing, you know, tea time coupons. So uh, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't see a lot of people investing in golf course tea time coupons. Uh, but uh, I don't know about you guys. In terms of uh, regulation, right, uh, what's going on in China now? Because, like, so China, many... 
Yeah, so the China regulation is a question. So we, we saw the rise and the subsequent closure of the Chinese Bitcoin exchange market. And that came to an abrupt end in uh, September last year, of 2017. So the process leading up to that, so the, uh, obviously we had the big hype and hoopla in 2013. That was almost five years ago. Uh, and then most recently, a year and a half ago, in January of 2017, that's when the Chinese regulators first came and uh, tried to figure out what's going to happen. And we, we had our ups and downs. In January, we all got called in to a meeting with the PBOC. And then by March time, all the Chinese exchanges actually shut down withdrawals, uh, if you recall. And the purpose of that was to try to please the regulators and say, hey, there's not going to be any more you know, money escaping the system. Because if Bitcoin withdrawals are stopped, you can only trade on the price. Then, uh, then of course, the price came down artificially, but also people couldn't get access to the actual crypto assets. So that stayed until June, and by June, all the exchanges lifted the things again. We had thought, and I'll share a sort of uh, insider, uh, industry insider knowledge with you. We had actually thought, we all thought that the license was coming. We were this close. So according to our sources in the different regulated departments, the, there was a final draft of the Chinese so-called... Uh, crypto exchange licensing documentation. It listed all the prerequisites to apply for the license and who would get it, and there's going to be three exchanges that's going to get it, and so on and so forth. We were this close. But uh, the trigger, this, is, this, is, this may be surprising to you, the trigger was actually the WannaCry virus uh, malware in May of 2017. Do you guys remember that? The, the WannaCry you know, infestation. Anitus, so I do. A lot of uh, uh, sites and, you know, regular companies, and it demanded ransom in Bitcoin. So that actually gave Bitcoin a very bad name. The governments were all afraid again. Oh my gosh, Bitcoin's being used for bad purposes. But so is the U.S. dollar and the Chinese renminbi. But anyways, so since Bitcoin was used to ransom for that, they all got nervous and they rethought the process. And at the time, by June, July, the ICO wave came in full blown. And that's when I think it was August, they decided, okay, the heck with it, we're in a reverse direction, not issue licenses in China, but rather put a full stop to everything. So on September 4th, they issued a notice, put a full stop to all ICO, declared all ICOs illegitimate forms of fundraising. They asked all ICO issuers in China to refund all the fundraising via ICOs and the private sales and all that stuff. And then in that notice, at the very bottom, they say this applies to all fiat and crypto exchanges. So that was a loophole. Uh, well, it's not a loophole. It's actually the, um, the circle everything. It was like the check mark, select everything. So uh, when we saw that, we're like, they must just be talking about ICOs. We, 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 you know, we thought that Bitcoin and all that were in the clear. But apparently 10 days later, we found out that was not the case. They're going to use that last paragraph to apply to everything. So all the exchanges uh, voluntarily shut down. I do remember that times because I was in China and uh, I had to uh, go to some of the conferences, but all of them were shut down too. Most of them, or moved to Hong Kong. So it was absolutely crazy times. Um, you already mentioned BTCC and um, told that you've shut it down. No, we shut down BTC China Exchange. So BTCC, our international business, actually got acquired by investment group in Hong Kong. So that got acquired in earlier this year. Okay, so you, you as you've said, are a free man right now, uh, selling the world. Yeah, and uh, I want to emphasize the free part because some of my Chinese colleagues are actually on lockdown. They can't leave the country. But uh, I'm, I'm, uh, I go in and out with, with pleasure. <laughs> Great. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because, because I, um, I follow the, the wishes of what they want. Um, <laughs> So guys, let's uh, get back to the initial subject. Uh, we've, uh, we've mentioned uh, institutional investors, right? Um, and we've mentioned the low liquidity and uh, the quality of trading right now. So, um, before coming back to, to uh, the game changer, to institutional investors, as I think, um, who are the people trading now? Let's go deeper, right? So if we say that trading right now is low and the quality is low and the liquidity is well, who are the people trading? What the so corporations have Bitcoin on their balance sheet and Ether on their balance sheet. In fact, it's a big topic of debate amongst audit firms. I used to work for one. 
as to how accounting, what the accounting treatment for crypto should be, right? And it's a complex question because it depends on the tokens or the cryptocurrency you're holding because uh, it, depending on the type of the asset, the accounting treatment is going to be different, but it's a big topic of debate. Then uh, remember that most of the volume for crypto in the world is OTC. It's over the counter. It's not going through exchanges. I mean, at least 80%, if not more. So if you look at the likes of Circle, Poloniex, uh, Poloniex uh, got acquired, uh, but uh, Octagon Strategies and some of the big OTC desks, then they're still processing the majority of the volume. Then uh, that will move to exchanges when exchanges, and, and, and a lot of hedge funds or to the extent in certain countries where institutions are allowed to invest uh, are actually going OTC. They're not going through exchanges because exchanges aren't quite ready for uh, to support institutional requirements. Now, when you think about investment banks, uh, then investment banks have to worry about a very large number of regulations, right? They have to worry about the Volcker rule, uh, as in they can't trade prop unless the asset is uh, treated, uh, unless the asset class is permitted for trading. If they want to make a market, then they have to do a lot of uh, compliance and regulatory work before they can actually make a market in crypto assets. Uh, they have to worry about custody. Right, so crypto custody is still a big topic, and you can do cold storage, but as a market maker, cold storage doesn't work because you want to, uh, you know, trade in and out of the asset quite quickly. So then there is a whole bunch of uh, uh, concern amongst regulators about systemic risk. Once they open the door to crypto, then how long before crypto becomes a ten trillion asset, like junk bonds in Michael Milken's times, and brings down a, a major institution? Right, so pension funds have restrictive investment policies, asset managers have restrictive investment policies. So this is the thing, when institutions enter this space, they will bring a very large body of regulation with them, and that's something exchanges aren't prepared for, whether it comes to their technology preparedness or you know, regulatory preparedness, and Coin Coinbase in particular is making a lot of steps in this direction, but then a number of other exchanges have to sort of uh, up their game in terms of uh, compliance, because it, it isn't just about KYC and AML. It's about a very large set of regulations around market risk, credit risk, and operational risk, and sort of hiring a bunch of auditors to look at what you're doing. Uh, and you know, getting a good, good body of lawyers uh, to look after your activities before you can say, yes, we are an exchange that's open to institutional business. Is it a positive or a negative thing for... Uh, I, I think it's inevitable, right? So it's crypto is a new asset class, uh, and crypto is also a, a blockchain at the end of the day is a technology for a vastly more efficient implementation of existing asset classes. So if you think about... Uh, how the equity markets work today, right? Listed equities are very, very efficient, right? So you can trade very large volumes in and out for very, very low cost. I mean, I'm talking uh, hundreds, hundreds of uh, BIPs, so for very large block trades. But when you think about uh, illiquid stocks or uh, gaming tokens or uh, commercial real estate in the middle of Berlin, then uh, a lot of these assets have no access to global liquidity, right? And the trading, listing, uh, all adds up to a lot of cost, which makes it very, very difficult for people to monetize the, the various uh, assets that they might be holding, whether it's intellectual property and so on and so forth. So tokens as a technology allow digitization of all of these assets, of all of this property that people are sitting on, and uh, give them access to liquidity. And that's really the value of... Uh, uh, even the long-term value of crypto, because uh, you know you can create a lot of liquidity for assets that don't currently have liquidity, and therefore create a vastly more efficient global capital market. Now, today you have to go through a CSD, multiple custodians. You have to go through. Uh, there is a very long list of intermediaries that eats into my pension, right? So, with blockchain, uh, we can create a global capital market. We can, uh, with where the blockchain is effectively a CSD. It's the registry of uh, balances as well as the contracts that govern the behavior of those assets and therefore create a vastly more efficient market infrastructure. And, and this is going to be a global digital asset market, right? Now, in order to do that, we need globalized regulation. So G20 is, has asked for, uh, uh, some, sometime late this month, 
for opinions from uh, crypto market players as to how the regulation should be harmonized and so on. So, so the regulators are aware that this is going to be a global market. Regulators are aware that uh, there, there needs to be adoption. Uh, sorry, uh, the regula regulations need to be adopted for this new world that's coming for all of us. Now, so I think it's up to the crypto community, which is us, to engage proactively. But is it a positive? Absolutely. I mean, most of the money is still managed by institutions, right? And it isn't just a positive because if people are holding will, crypto will get very rich. But it's a positive because once institutions are in this game, then we can have a far more organized, regulated, and well-behaved digital asset market. Well, we say can, can, we are in process, and so on. So when do you think, what are... Um the terms, and when do you think it will happen? Yeah, so this reminds me of what Joe, uh, Joe is the CEO of Consensus and the co-founder of Ethereum said in uh, New York at the blockchain accounting conference, which is, if, if you are in the, if, you know, we are linear thinkers in the middle of a non-linear space. So uh, you feel like if you're not in that process, then you feel like nothing is happening, nothing is happening, nothing is happening, and then suddenly, Blockchain is everywhere, right? So we have seen this with other technologies. And if you're not actually involved in some of these conversations, then you feel like nothing is happening. But remember, the, the, we are trying to change 50 years of regulation, right? So we are trying to, uh, and, and the, uh, the last, this regulation that exists today in securities markets was written for technology that's now several decades old. Now we have brand new technology, which isn't quite ready, by the way. So you know that's evolving as well and maturing as well. So regulators are also coming up to speed, and regulators aren't engineers, right? Normally, so it's up to us as the crypto community to engage and sort of educate and uh, help influence the policy, and you know, and also govern our own behavior, right? So we gotta act, get our act together. Of course. So uh, talking about crypto exchanges, we cannot mention hacks, right? <laughs> and um, According to one of the latest articles that I've just read, uh, around 1.2 billion were stolen uh, in crypto, and uh, one of the major parts of them was stolen from the crypto exchanges. Um, um, during the uh, first day of block show, I've heard the phrase that backs are hacked every day, but no one talks about it, right? So, but everyone talks about the crypto exchanges hacks. So, what do you think? It's a real big problem in terms of security and in terms of a long term. Uh, trust in the community, and uh, or it's just an essential thing. I mean, all these hacks and uh, crypto, sto uh, crypto hacks. So I'll, I'll just take two minutes and I'll pass this on. So a couple of things, right? When a bank is hacked, then uh, in the U.S., my deposits are insured by the FDIC to a certain limit. In the U.K., they're also insured. When a bank, when my bank is hacked, I can get some money back. <laughs> when crypto is hacked, we chose this life, right? So we said, oh, it's peer to peer. It's decentralized. The government should stay out of it. So obviously, I can't get any money back. Now, there are some uh, protocol changes that have been proposed, right? So Parity Wallet got hacked. And the Parity guys have a few proposals as to how that money can be recovered. Now, at some point, uh, blockchain protocols might come up with uh, solutions that allow honest investors to recover their money, right? And uh, but, but that's, that's a hard problem to solve. At the same time, decentralized exchanges, right, depending on how decentralized they are, and that's my area of work, uh, 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 normally assign the custody of assets to the individual. You can trade straight out of your ledger wallet or treasure wallet, right? Now, in that case, you're obviously responsible for the custody of your own assets. But if you want to implement an institutional custodian, and uh, to plug in a little bit of a shameless commercial here, we are building a, an institutional-grade custody platform called Trustology. And you need to buy insurance. So a custodian needs to provide insurance. As uh, That's one of the parts of being an institutional-grade custodian, right? Now, uh, but at, uh, so, so uh, uh, yes, custody is a, is a major challenge. And part of the reason custody is a major challenge, because it's a, it's a, it's a game between hackers and people who are trying to protect your assets and people who are trying to steal your assets. And you sometimes don't know who is who. Uh, but at the same time, th there is a lot of progress that's happening with uh, technology in the custody space. We are expecting institutional-grade solutions to be ready uh, by the end of this year, at least our own. And uh, but uh, I mean, it's uh, for crypto that's that individuals want to manage on their own, and uh, there is no mandate from the regulators as to how custody should be done, especially for decentralized exchanges. I don't have a good answer as to where the world will go. But in the long run, uh, once this market gets more and more regulated then the, and governments intervene, then there will be a need to protect small investors and, and grandma, 
my grandma is my favorite investor. And uh, grandma. probably some FDIC-like scheme will be created. Um, I don't think I don't think FDIC scheme could work for for um, for crypto. The reason is in FDIC's case, they they just print more money and you know make everyone happy because it's basically debasing everyone else for the small few people that got hacked. But in crypto, let me remind everyone that uh, two two things. Number one is that there's only theft if it's worth stealing. That's a basis. Right? In the old days, whether it's ships shipping gold over the oceans, there would be pirates trying to steal these ships, the gold from the ship. And then when there's Pony Express moving the gold from one coast to the other coast, there'd be these thieves trying to steal the, the wagons and the chest of gold and silver. And it's the same with crypto. I think every exchange is either getting hacked, got hacked, or will be hacked. Uh, in fact, every exchange will continue to be hacked in the coming years. I can assure you that. So the real issue is for, for all of you who invest, who have your, your crypto on exchanges for momentarily or for long periods of time, just make sure you're dealing with a reputable exchange that has the financial resources such that if they do get hacked, uh, their equity can, can cover the losses. You don't want to be dealing with an exchange that got hacked years after years and then find out, you know, let's say on a January or two, February of 2014, that, oh, sorry, we, we're, we, you know, let's just use this one excuse and say, hey, we're, we're, completely, out of, we're completely out of it. We, we couldn't pay back everyone at all. So that, that's a real big problem. That's why I tell people, don't put your assets on the exchange unless you're trying to sell the Bitcoin, in which case you load it onto the exchange and sell it, or unless you're, you're loading money into it and you buy the crypto assets and you take the assets off. I don't care if it's tokens or crypto assets. And then in terms of insurance, uh, I, I, so when I ran my exchange, we actually talked to a lot of insurance companies. We even went to Lloyd's of London and talked to them. And what I found, and by the way, currently there are many crypto companies who, who have, who advertise they have, they have their uh, crypto insured. And if I were you, I'd read the fine line because I found out that the insurance industry is also quite greedy just like every business. I mean, they want to make money. They don't want to be in a sucker deal. So what I found, and, and you know, I can talk about it now because I'm not running an exchange. I'm not insuring any assets. It, it, you know, if you're doing custody service, same thing. What I found is those policies that they offer you will only pay you if all the conditions match, all the conditions are true. And inevitably, there'll be conditions out there that basically disqualify if you're you know, the day-to-day -day operations of a company and uh, your crypto assets. So in most cases, they buy the insurance. It's cheap. It's only 1% or 2% a year. And the reason it's so cheap is it doesn't pay out. Yes. You know, we wouldn't be talking about a theoretical. We'd all be using it. So there isn't one. Um, I've been in exchange business for more than five years, six years. And uh, maybe you call me traditionalist, but I think... I think in some ways, centralized exchanges are the only solution, especially with, when it comes to fiat money. Unless you guys are all out of fiat and all, all you trade is crypto to crypto, then maybe with atomic swaps and all that stuff, you could have a decentralized exchange. But until we don't use fiat or exchange into and out of fiat, in my mind, centralized exchanges are here to stay. It's same with, by the way, it's same with blockchain technologies. Um, can I rant about blockchain here? Or is this... Uh yeah, this is block show, right? I didn't say blockchain. Okay, anyways. So, so blockchain, my theory, and I'm going to write a book about this, is that blockchain is actually not suitable for any real-world activities. Is that a controversial statement? It is. Thank you. <laughs> I'm curious as to why. The reason I see is because people always talk about blockchain, the immutable, public, decentralized aspect of blockchain data. You know, everything's very public. You could verify it. That's great. But what people forget is the data that goes into blockchain had to be publicly verifiable in the first place. If the data that goes in is only from one source of truth, of my opinion of how I see the world, then, then that data is not decentralized data and publicly verifiable. That's just a centralized database that's publicly shared. So anyways, so same thing with decentralized exchanges that un until it's here, Let's, you know, we, we could be hopeful, but, um, but, but we're not the, re I'm not, I'm not a researcher. I'm not the engineer. 
So let, let them go do it, solve the problem, and then we can have you know, conferences and solutions for you these absolutely things. absolutely said it, right? So uh, for, when you're an engineer, you're always creating the future. So AirSwap went live and processed a million, uh, which is not a lot, by the way. A million is nothing in the world of crypto exchanges. But the point is that it is something. It is a number that matters, right? And uh, that number is on the up. So decentralized exchanges are becoming more important and more prominent than they were a year ago. So, uh, and, and for a lot of, for high liquidity assets or for primarily fiat to crypto exchanges, centralized exchanges are obviously a much better solution today, right? But uh, for crypto to crypto or for low liquidity assets where you don't want to pay a, pay a listing fee to a centralized exchange and so on and so forth, decentralized exchanges will inevitably uh, gain a lot of adoption. Yeah, well, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I need to add, uh, when you're talking about the AirSwap or 0x, it's only for one blockchain, it's only for Coinbase. Ethereum and tokens. So coin, yes, right, as of now. So Coinbase acquired Paradex. So clearly centralized exchanges know this is coming. Yeah, but actually 0x is centralized service, it's custody free, AirSwap is also centralized service, it's centralized order book. And if you're talking about high frequency trading, it's almost impossible to do it on blockchain. And blockchain is the purpose of the blockchain, it's not for high frequency orders and yes, etc. At low liquidity and you know at, at, at least for now. Yeah, yes, it's true. And uh, okay, for Ethereum and Ethereum based tokens, it can be a custody free solution uh, with uh, maybe some quite complicated you interface. Your ledger wallet. Yeah, but if you are talking about the cross blockchain transactions, uh, because in the real world, token economy is still small, only a few percent of all the exchange volume is coming from tokens trading. And uh, most of the exchange volume is coming from the fiat for sure and uh, from ODC desks. And uh, about 30 or 40% of the trading volume is for cross blockchain transactions like Bitcoin to Ether, Bitcoin to Litecoin. And uh, we realize it's, it's almost impossible to do some kind of decentralized exchange services. It's possible to do a service uh, around atomic swaps technology, but it's uh, pretty slow. It's, it's more li most likely like local Bitcoins experience, like marketplace. Yep, it's mostly about the swapping, but all the process, uh, it, it, it takes like about 30 minutes to do a swap, and uh, it's not the best user experience, actually. Just, just to, so in Berlin, we have a team called Gnosis. Gnosis was a consensus uh, venture. Now they have their own, uh, you know, they graduated. Uh, so they have created a, a platform which does uh, reverse auction trading, right? So central clearing, or rather, Central matching isn't the only way exchanges work. So for low liquidity assets, often you want to do a declining price auction, and that's known to be economically efficient. So Gnosis have a Dutch auction platform that's live, and uh, for a lot of assets, uh, you don't need a, a NASDAQ. For a lot of assets, you want to do a different kind of trading and clearing mechanism, and all of those experiments are open in the DEX space. We are coming close to uh, the next part of our agenda. So you've mentioned trading volume, and uh, I have a question in my head regarding what are the most active regions, and uh, I mean in terms of trading volumes, and in terms of trading as it is. I mean, Russia, Asia, maybe US. Uh, so the main market for us, uh, I can't say for uh, any exchange service, uh, as I see on the exchanges landscape, there are a lot of uh, regional services who operate only, especially with the fiat money. Uh, for instance, uh, if you see Kraken, Kraken has a different uh, jurisdictions, uh, and uh, now they operate on the US market, uh, the Europe market, uh, but it's uh, different companies actually. So you sign the contracts with uh, different companies if you are in the United States citizenship. Or... So according to Changely, the main market for us is still United States. About 50% of our trading volume is coming from United States customers. Also, Asia is pretty active. Uh, I'm impressed with South Korea, with Japan, with Hong Kong, uh, also with Thailand. Uh, a lot of traders from Thailand. Uh, Europe is uh, not so big for us. Uh, most of the countries, uh, it's uh, London, Gr Great Britain, and uh, Germany as well, and a uh, few others. But uh, I, I see that in Europe, our market is fragmented. In each country, they have their own service to exchange or to swap. Uh, so, but if you're talking about uh, let's say the huge liquidity providers, uh, and uh, most of the liquidity is concentrated on Binance or OKEx. Uh, if you check uh, the wallets of any cre uh, of any any token, you will see that okay, about 30 percent or even 50 percent of the tokens sitting on the Binance wallets or Bitrix wallets. 
So there was there was the liquidity. Thank you. So should we talk about regulation or self-regulation in our space? Absolutely. Sure, if you if you wanna if you wanna say please, Bobby. So my my question for for the panel, um, and maybe the audience can chime in. Are we going to wait for government to regulate crypto exchanges, or do you think jurisdictions will start to self-regulate? So they've already started. Singapore uh, have launched a consultation, and they have come up with a new category of exchanges, right? So they had two categories now. I'm forgetting the abbreviation, but they have come out with a consultation where they're proposing a third category of exchanges, specifically to support the decentralized exchange ecosystem. We should all respond to that consultation. Uh, at least we will. Uh, and uh, Abu Dhabi has uh, just uh, completed a consultation on uh, spot crypto asset markets, right? Uh, this activity is starting in various jurisdictions already, and uh, uh, I, th I think it's time to engage with that process. Yeah. Yeah, I believe uh, regulation is an important topic. Uh, it shouldn't be too tight that there's no creativity in, in entrepreneurship and everything like that. So that's a big discussion. But actually, we chose um, to incorporate in, in Liechtenstein due to something called the Blockchain Act. So with the Blockchain Act, the government is actually opening up uh, a set of laws which are enabling the industry to thrive, which are like loose enough to uh, give a framework but still not um, like making it too strict that it's completely blocked. And I think that the balance needs to be right. And uh, so this will be officially announced alongside the launch of our platform, like end of June. And so everybody watch out for what's coming out of Liechtenstein. I think it, um, I know what's coming up, so we have been working with the government very closely to already be uh, ready when, when it's coming up. And uh, so what I see now is that it's basically one of the key competitors against uh, Singapore, Malta, uh, probably other jurisdictions, uh, especially in Europe, probably one of the best places to be. Yeah, so I'm actually super excited to hear these comments. Mm. And the reason I ask the question is because for the first time, now we have this industry, because it's crypto in nature, these exchanges business can really go everywhere. It can go anywhere in the world. There are over 200 countries in the world. So basically, it's going to be very competitive. Some countries are currently making the wrong choices and clamping down, and they're going to find themselves just going to be uncompetitive. They really kill their, kill their you know, gold-laying goose. And they're forcing the business to go to other jurisdictions, which is more open-minded. So I'm really excited that other, you know, many countries in the world are starting to realize that they could leap ahead. It's just like some countries, before they developed all the telephone networks, they won't go straight to mobile. Yep. Right. India. So some countries maybe miss the internet sort of revolution. They can go straight to crypto. And I think that's going to be very exciting in the coming years. And that's, that's also so exciting about the industry overall we're in. So I've never seen any technology where government started to compete like where you should open up your company. Yeah. And um, so th this is also the, because of the fact that it's a really global market and nobody has tackled that before. So even if you're locally, you actually have to think global from day one um, as clients could come from, from every jurisdiction in every country. I think, and then, and then the, the ecosystem overall might empower changes where governments might be at risk. Um, they will be disrupted as they are losing kind of key uh, financial assets within within the country itself. And when you look at countries like Venezuela, it could be the kind of empowering a whole revolution. And I think the key infrastructure players need to be in place for that. So. Um, exchanges are definitely one of the key infrastructures which we had to involve and expand in terms of functionalities. To now, one thing I would add is that exchanges and clearinghouses, or rather what we call financial markets infrastructure, is one of the most regulated activities in all of financial services, right? So the, I mean, you have to worry about KYC and AML, you have to worry about IT resilience, you have to worry about custody-related rules, you have to worry about systemic risk, and prudential regulation, and you have to worry about market manipulation, market transparency. There's a very, very long list of rules and regulations that you have to worry about if you're running a NASDAQ, right? Now, when crypto starts to become that important and that systemically important, then us cryptos will also have to worry about all that. So if we don't educate ourselves upfront right now, which is, and engage with regulators, right away, then we will get the regulation by default. We'll get the regulation which is, no, thank you, you can't do it, right? So, which is why it's quite important that we, in the crypto community, sort of take a, get ahead of the game 
and learn about what regulations are already in place today for current market infrastructure, and then see how it needs to be adopted. All of those rules need to be adopted for this new infrastructure. Uh, yeah, yeah, I just want to say, uh, to be honest, I'm not so happy with regulation, but I understand that governments is trying to protect you just uh, against fraud and a lot of fraud in crypto community. Yeah, that's true. Uh, but one thing, uh, why I love Bitcoin, you can transfer a million dollars uh, from one wallet to another wallet and just pay five, five bucks for that and uh, you don't care, is it a bank or should I sign some transactions or sign some documents uh, like for wire transfers, especially for cross-border. And it's, it's, that's what, what, uh, that's what, what uh, as, as I see, it's uh, like a parallel world. Here is old cryptocurrency. Uh, old money vaults uh, regulated, highly strong regulated, and here is a new cryptocurrency vault. And uh, for sure, it, uh, when the vaults are crossing, it's uh, fiat to crypto transactions. Yeah, I, I think it should be regulated, yeah, just against fraud. But if you're talking about all the cryptocurrency market, um, I think it will grow really faster if, it, 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 if it's still uh, just uh, like uh, not, not, not so close with the regulation, yeah. That's, that's what my opinion. And there might be a lot of platforms who won't be regulated at all. They will, like, and, and they are already. So, they, I mean, they are operating globally. And the, the beauty of it is actually that it, it just works, like it gives freedom to, back to the people. While, so this is the kind of overall, overall concept. And if you, if you talk to um, a couple of, like, true early adopters, um, you see that they don't think about regulation at all. They think the government and, and, and the old system has to change uh, rather than adapting it to the old rules. And I think if you look at a lot of innovation problems, you can't fix the future problems with like old tools. You, tools need to be adapted Absolutely. in a way. And we are in the process of doing that. This is why we launched Project Brooklyn, right? Project Brooklyn is about creating best practices on a community basis. I mean, as by engaging the broader blockchain and crypto community and going, and then we have a process of engaging with the policy makers uh, as part of Project Brooklyn. And uh, you're very, everybody is very welcome to join, but we are also support other initiatives to create community-based best practices that we can then educate the policy in agencies, uh, bodies on. Mm. Talk them, talking about two parallel worlds, one is crypto world and one is regulated one. Will then, if it happens, this world, which is crypto world that you've mentioned, will be illegal then? I, I, th I think it should be like a distributed government, uh, actually, in, cri in crypto world. Yeah, it's... Future, right? <laughs> it sounds like maybe utopia for now, but I believe in distributed governments, actually. So, and if you are talking about the globalization, the businesses are becoming more and more global. And I couldn't even imagine that uh, I can serve the customers all over the world now. So, just in a few clicks. And it's uh, pretty cool. And uh, so I'm expect uh, for sure governments, I'm expect distributed organization based on protocols on the blockchain. So that's it's what my opinion. So I, I actually agree that crypto is a threat to many governments. So many governments are jealous of the success of, of crypto assets, cryptocurrencies. So it's very conceivable that co some countries will actually ban the notion of people, private citizens, holding crypto. So that might be the law. Uh, you know, some countries already have the pseudo law. Uh, but but the, the real issue is it's, it's impossible to enforce because crypto is just information. So we could memorize it. We have on a piece of paper. There's plausible deniability. You could tattoo it on the back of your neck or whatever. So, so it's one of those things where in the future there will be countries that are truly free, where people will have the freedom to hold crypto and freedom of money. And then there'll be other countries who actually outlaw crypto, just like some countries outlaw certain religions. Same kind of thing. We are the shift of power, actually, back, back, back to the people. Back to the people, absolutely. With that power, also a lot of people don't want to happen, see that happening. So that's why there's not so much reports about banks being hacked, because they want to suppress the kind of new things which are coming up. So, um, and, then, and then you actually see that the, uh, the ecosystems have to be uh, developed a little bit better to, to make the power shift happen. I mean, so the regulators we have engaged with, and I sp uh, spent a fair amount of time with regulators, in, at least in the US and the UK. Uh, in the UK, the FCA's view is that we don't regulate technology, we regulate behavior. 
an activity, right? If it's a financial service or a financial activity, then the behavior should be governed by the same set of principles. And uh, I think it's a fair notion. In the US, the regulation and policy making is more rules based, right? Uh, but uh, here is my take on it, which is we are not waiting for the rules to happen. We are working with. Uh, uh, we, we want, I mean, policymakers have a hard job. Regulators have a really difficult job first to understand this technology, then to understand what's really going on, and then to create an environment where consumers are protected and investors are protected, right? So that's important. Those are policy objectives. And it's up, to, uh, which is why we are proactively engaging and not waiting for things to happen. And I think that's what we should do. Thank you so much. I guess we, we are almost run out of time. So to crown it all, um, I guess we can say that decentralized exchanges is some kind of an illusion, right? For now, especially for now. Uh, regulation is coming. Air swap. Right? Institutional investors is a game changer for the crypto exchanges and for the whole community. And who knows, according to Konstantin, there will be two worlds, two different worlds, one crypto world and one wholly regulated one. Thank you so much for listening to us for 50 minutes. It was a pleasure for us and hope valuable for you. Thank you. Thank you very much.